Hello, I am Dr. Charles Aaron, and with me today is Dr. Robert Kolb. Dr. Kolb has just published yet another book on the Lutheran Confessions. If you're at all familiar with him, you know he's one of the most prolific authors that we've had in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and we are blessed for that. I can truly say that Dr. Kolb has not only published a great deal on the Confessions, but does so in a way that makes the Confessions come alive and be a practical value for the pastor and the teacher and the like. The title of this book is The Way of Concord, From the Historic Text to Contemporary Witness. So Bob, could you tell me just a little bit or tell us a little bit about how this particular book arose? That's a collection of several essays that uh, I've written, uh, two of them uh, with you. And uh, the, the thing that really brought them together was a conversation with my college classmate, a longtime friend, uh, Ray Holm, who is uh, former president of Concordia University in Irvine and now uh, uh, head of the QNET operation uh, of the Concordia uh, University system. Uh, I had filmed, uh, actually I've filmed twice, the confessions course that QNET offers uh, as part of its colloquy program. Let me ask, what is QNET? QNET is the Concordia University um, uh, uh, distance learning operation okay. uh, in which all the universities have a role uh, and it, it uh, operates under a, a former President Holmes' direction. Is it for the colloquy of uh, the, teachers? The program or? that I've worked with uh, provides a, a instruction uh, for colloquy uh, the colloquy program for teachers. Uh, so they take, uh, I think it's eight courses, uh, and one of them is on the Confessions. So you did a video series for them on the Confessions. Yes, and then Ray said, um, I'd like to see some of the other things you'd written. Uh, one of them was, was a text that I'd prepared for a partner church that was uh, not used by that partner church, but was actually published uh, in Estonian translation as the introduction to the Book of Concord when the Estonians brought out their new... Um, or their first translation of the entire Book of Concord a few years ago. And that's never appeared in English. It's, it's a kind of summary of, of the book that you and I did with Jim Nestingen, uh, a kind of historical background. Uh, and so it, it, it looks very, very briefly without footnotes. Uh, but but I, I gave that to Ray and, and I gave a couple of other essays, one I had done for the International Luther, Lutheran uh, Council at its meeting, oh, 10, 12 years ago on how the formula of Concord really uh, is a, 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 a provides a method for uh, looking at the concerns of all the parties in a dispute and resolving a, uh, those uh, concerns, bringing together the two sides uh, with a common expression of the faith on the basis of scripture. Uh, and there were a couple of other essays. And, and Ray said, oh, this would be great to have for our students. And so um, I uh, talked to, um, Managing Editor Scholl, and we, um, we proceeded with bringing these essays together. And yes, this book in particular is published by Seminary Press mm -hmm. and just coming hot off the presses. Uh, if I may ask, now, I mean, you've been involved in something like uh, Deep Bekentness Shrift In with the catechisms. You were obviously one of the editors for the Coldwinger edition of the Book of Concord. You um, you were a key person in writing the new historical introductions for the Book of Concord, along with Jim Nestingen um, and myself. And Charles Aaron. <laughs> and you've written extensively. What is different about this collection of essays, or what do you see as the unique contribution? In other words, why would one turn to this book, or what would one turn to this book for, as opposed to some of your other writings? Well, it, it's true that I haven't had a new idea in 450 years. Um, I think what, what uh, helps with this book is that, uh, for instance, even in our, uh, our Fortress Press publication, The Lutheran uh, Confessions, uh, we don't go into issues of confessional subscription and, and, uh, and contemporary application. Mm -hmm. We don't draw all the conclusions that, um, that I or you and I uh, in, in a couple of those essays um, have drawn about how uh, the confessions really do move from historic uh, confession to contemporary witness. And, and so I think um, uh, 
the, the new edition of the Bekenntnisschriften that came out in German is something that most of us are not going to crack. It's even bigger than the 1930 mm -hmm. uh, version of this, um, of, of the original texts. Uh, the confessions themselves uh, give us the, uh, our norma normata, our, our secondary authority for, for our teaching. Um, but I think what the Way of Concord, as a little volume that's easily readable uh, in a couple of evenings, uh, does is, is to, to stimulate thinking about just what does this mean for today? How do we actually live out our, our Lutheran identity in the kind of ecumenical witness that uh, Melanchthon gave at Augsburg, uh, the kind of edification that Luther uh, designed in the catechisms, the kind of evangelistic witness that even though the Lutherans of the 16th century didn't have much chance to practice, they didn't meet unbaptized people very often, they knew in principle belongs to the very essence of the church. Well, if I can uh, put you on the spot, uh, what most intrigues me about this book is the subtitle, From Historic Text to Contemporary Witness. Would you be able to give an example or two of how it helps with a contemporary witness? You already mentioned earlier um, about your essay for the Estonian church and how that might help with dealing with conflicts. Um, could you either elaborate on that or maybe give another example from one of the other essays on how this can, can actually help a pastor or a lay person or a teacher uh, give better witness? Uh, the, the essay that the Estonians used, and that's maybe 40 pages, that's a, a bit longer piece, that actually um, simply goes into the historical background. So it's a, okay. it's a quick read uh, for someone who just wants a, a quick historical overview. The, um, the essay on the formula of Concord as a, a, a model for, um, for settling uh, differences uh, among us uh, takes very seriously the fact that uh, in, for instance, the article on good works, uh, Georg Meyer had said good works are necessary for salvation because he wanted to make sure that there would be Christian obedience flowing from faith, not because he wanted to teach that uh, good works earn salvation. Nicholas von Amsdorf repeated Luther's line, good works are detrimental to salvation, not because he thought that good works shouldn't be done. He wrote another essay, uh, uh, good works are necessary for the Christian life, uh, but they are detrimental to salvation uh, because uh, uh, when they are uh, the object of our reliance in terms of making us, ourselves look good before God. So, so what, um, what the formula did was to honor both concerns uh, and to simply say good works are necessary for the Christian life. They are a necessary result of justification. Um, they are not to be used uh, as a means of justification. And the, the formula so honors both concerns uh, and finds language to do that. Well, if scripture. I may then um, jump in here with regard to possible takeaways because I think that's a really good example. Would it be fair to say that a couple of takeaways from that would be one, avoid theology as slogans. Yes. Because what you said was true, you know, good works are detrimental to salvation if you trust them yeah. or put your trust in them, but if you leave it at that statement, then it's problematic. Yeah. So don't do theology by slogans. Yeah. Uh, secondly, the it seems to me the opposite of one error can also be an error. Yes. So you don't do theology by saying, oh, good works are necessary for salvation. I'm going to say the opposite. Yeah. They're detrimental to salvation. Yeah. And then what you said at the very end sounds like the third takeaway would be is it sort of sets boundaries. And like you said, it sort of setting boundaries almost, it seems to me, for how one talks or doesn't talk. Yes. So. You can talk in a way that good works are necessary, but not for salvation. Yeah. And you can talk in a way that good works are detrimental to salvation if you trust them, yeah. but they're not detrimental for your neighbor right. <laughs> or for yourself. Or for, or for the joy of, of practicing them. Or for the, the joy faith. of practicing them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I think that, that's right. We, we, uh, when we accept the, the, uh, 
the Book of Concord as our secondary authority. We, we bind ourselves to it, um, but I find it liberating at the same time because it means that I don't have to, to come up with all the answers all the time, that I have, I have the counsel of, of uh, 450, uh, almost yeah. 500 years of, of uh, good theological thinking. Uh, that is not only from the authors, but shared by, by many Christians across the ages. Um, and the, the, the other thing it does is it, it really does give us um, the content of what we teach, um, but I think it also shows us how we're to go about teaching that content. And that's what I hope that some of these essays highlight. I think that's, uh, personally, it's one of the great benefits I have had from being your student and reading your writings is it seemed to me that I learned from you that theology is not a finished product or cannot be seen as simply a set quantity mm -hmm. of certain propositions. Like you said, it is content, but it also gives us a way of teaching that content and a way of thinking about it for our own context yeah. and today as well. Well, my, my recent work with, with Luther's sermons particularly, but also with his uh, lectures on the, on the scripture at the University of Wittenberg, have convinced me that, um, that Luther was convinced God is a God of history. God is, has interwoven his own uh, history uh, with ours. Uh, that's what, what Luther's revealed God is all about. And uh, in his revelation, uh, he addresses, as we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament, he addresses specific situations in specific ways. Uh, one of the things that I marvel about Luther, by 1520 or so, he had the core of his theology down cold, and that never changed. Uh, he had gone through maybe a decade of, of development of, and ever deepening into the, into the truth of Scripture and, and had a firm idea of that by 1520. He never stopped in the last 25 years of his life, never stopped experimenting with new ways of expressing that core. So the, the core doctrines were there, um, but the, the way he talked about them um, did change when he was confronted by new questions, by different situations, as his, his message spread over an ever wider area, and thus raised uh, some specific new questions. I find that to be incredibly helpful and, as you mentioned, uh, even liberating. So by entering into conversation or dialogue with the Book of Concord in this book and with Luther, one also is, in a sense, entering their own their way, way of thinking. Yes. So that it also can shape our own way of thinking for today. Yeah, and I think that's part of, um, part of uh, what we have uh, to contribute to the discussion within the whole household of faith as we take seriously the, the ecumenical responsibility that Melanchthon practiced in, in Augsburg already and <clears throat> modeled for us there. Very good. Thank you, Bob. It's Thank you. Uh, always good to talk with you and to talk the Book of Concord and theology with you. So I hope you are able to check out uh, Bob's latest book, The Way of Concord, From Historic Text to Contemporary Witness. It is available from our seminary bookstore, and it will also be available from Amazon. One of the leading scholars of my generation um, is a real treasure and a gift, so please check out that book. Thank you.